Go ahead. I'll go ahead. So, uh, honest for us to be here at, uh, at Notre Dame, and uh, we are, our, our book, Rebuilt and Tools for Building, has been published through Ave Maria Press, which is out here at Notre Dame. So, we, we came out yesterday to uh, meet with them, so that was its kind of double win for us. Uh, just a little background about uh, myself. Again, my name is Tom Corcoran, serve as associate pastor at Church of Nativity in uh, Baltimore, in Timodium, Maryland, right outside Baltimore. Um, just a little other background about myself. I grew up outside of Philadelphia, went to Catholic school my whole life, um, but didn't do much in the parish beyond that. So in, in, in high school, I didn't do youth ministry or anything like that. Uh, went to Loyola College outside Baltimore, or in Baltimore. I was a writing and political science major. I had no interest in working for the church or doing anything with the church. Um, when I graduated, I moved down to Washington, D.C., and uh, my kind of plan was I'd done some pro-life work at Loyola. My dad was in pro-life stuff, so I thought maybe I'd get involved in pro-life politics, maybe work for a politician on Capitol Hill, and maybe one day run for office myself. So that was kind of my professional vision. Uh, during this uh, year after I graduated from Loyola, uh, being very serious about my girlfriend at the time, now wife, Mia, and so uh, that was kind of what's going on in my life. And after a few months in Washington, D.C., I realized I did not like Washington too much. It just, the ethos of the town didn't fit me. I didn't see myself there long term. And so I, I was beginning to, to form a different vision for myself professionally. Thought maybe about actually getting a, going back to school, taking some political philosophy classes, getting a doctorate. I'd really liked those classes at Loyola. And uh, maybe become a teacher, sort of the path I was considering. And as all this was going on, I was very serious about my girlfriend at the time, ready to propose to her, Mia, and very uncertain about my future uh, uh, professionally that I got a, a call from a professor I had at Loyola who asked me if I was interested in a career change. And I said, as a matter of fact, I am. I'm, I'm trying to discern my future. And she said, well, can I introduce you to Father White? And he has a youth ministry position at the church. Would you talk to him? And so uh, Father Michael and I had some conversations and uh, after a few meetings, he offered me the job to do youth ministry at Nativity. And so I was discerning what I should do with my life. Should I, I know I wanted to get married, but should I take this job at Nativity, or should I go to school and pursue this uh, degree in political philosophy? And I thought, you know what, if I'm getting married, I probably should have a paycheck. <laughs> and so I started working in the church for the money. That was my, uh, my entry, yeah. <laughs> which is not a really smart idea at the time. Um, but, and obviously you don't stay in ministry or stay working for the church for the money, or you're not very smart. Um, uh, but uh, I, I thought I would stay in nativity two or three years, something more important would come along, and I would go do that next. And I came to the conclusion there's really nothing more important than working in the local parish, and that there was nothing else worth my time and my devotion and my life to do, and so um, through, uh, I've been at Nativity now for a minute for, for about 15 years, and through that time of certain various uh, roles, I've worked in youth ministry, children's ministry, um, I've worked building small groups up, at our, which are kind of our key adult faith formation, and uh, now I serve again as associate to Father Michael. And so what we're sharing with you today comes from our work in the parish, and we like this, and some of the successes that have come in our parish in Timonium, Maryland. And what we want to share with you is some of the strategies that have driven a transformation in our parish, that have led to uh, nearly tripling of our, our, our operational budget, that have has led to a great increase in volunteerism, to uh, increase in the weekend attendance, uh, more than doubling our weekend attendance. And just the great spirit and momentum that's, that's been gained at our church. Um, but what we like to say is this, that we are the world-class experts of what works in a place, in, in church, that works in, in, in evangelization and discipleship in a place called Timonium, Maryland. <laughs> so we're the world-class experts about Timonium. And what we want to do is just share what's worked in our setting and hope there's some transferable principles that will work in your setting as well. Um, and so we, we hope you'll... We'll find uh, we're just pouring what's in our cup into your cup. In such an august setting, um, it's a little intimidating for people who are essentially parish ministers to come and to, 
to speak, especially since we don't really know any of you or your background. So we just begin very frankly and very simply by saying our only criterion for being here is our work in the parish. And as soon as we're finished today, we'll be headed back to our parish to be working there this weekend, like many of you probably our work back at the parish isn't being done by somebody else while we're here. Uh, it's going to be waiting there for us when we get back, and so we're eager to get back to it. But meanwhile, we're very happy to be with you today. Now, as we begin, let me just pose a question to you. And the question is basically, why? As in, why am I here? Why am I doing this? That kind of question is, is, is sort of a lifelong question that um, um, we carry with us throughout life. Sometimes it, it can pop up at a party where we don't know many people and we feel uncomfortable and we ask ourselves, why did we come? It doubtless happened to you in school. You had one class or another that you were required to take, but all the way through the class, you kept asking yourself, why am I in this class? I will never need this information. It's not really a big deal unless and until it is. Unless and until we start asking that question about major issues, significant areas of our life, like our work, or our parish, or our vocation, or marriage, or your family. In the busyness of life, the why question usually doesn't get asked soon enough, or often enough, because we're just running around doing what we need to do, getting through the week, or in our case, the weekend, checking off uh, the to-dos on our to-do list with no time uh, for why. But answering the question is vitally important. It provides purpose and meaning. It adds value. It'll get, it, get us through the difficult days, and it will make the good times more enjoyable. Knowing why we do what we do matters. And so, we could ask the question, why do we do what we do at our parishes? Why does the church exist? Why does the local church exist? Why does that heart of the local church, which is our parish community, exist? And why do we do what we do there? When we first began working in our parish, to the extent that we reflected on it at all, we thought our job was to provide better service to church people. We came to a parish, as Tom suggests, uh, pretty thoughtlessly and with absolutely no background whatsoever. And we came to a parish that was rather a sleepy parish. There just wasn't a lot going on. And we thought that that was the problem. Low energy, lack of activities and programs and services. And if we just offered more for the parishioners, we could get them more involved and we could grow a successful parish. In the process, we fell unwittingly into what we came to call a consumer mentality. That the people in our pews were essentially customers. They were there to consume religion or pastoral programs or whatever it is that they were coming to us to receive. And it was our job to help them consume. We were there retail suppliers. And we, we embraced this role, both Tom and I, who for a while were pretty much it when it came to our parish staff, set about trying to do that with as much energy and enthusiasm as we could muster. And so in the process, we expanded kids and student programs. Tom, as youth minister, put together all kinds of student programs to get our teenagers involved which basically meant getting them just to show up. We launched new musical programs and offered all kinds of concerts and fellowship programs, receptions, bus trips, lectures. We expanded member care as far as we could dream up ways of taking it from coffee after daily mass to complimentary lunches after funerals. We layered on all kinds of devotional programs too. A lot of it in hindsight was a waste of time. The situation was reminiscent of that old story, Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, 
And that outrageous figure of the Red Queen, who says to Alice, Now here you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get anywhere, you'll have to run at least twice as fast as that. That was us. The more we provided, the faster we had to run just to stay in the same place. But the more that we provided, the more was demanded. Just like Alice, who never paused to reflect on why she was running that crazy race for the insatiable queen, we hadn't considered why we were doing what we were doing and what it is we were accomplishing. And the net effect of our efforts was creating consumers. You know that you're dealing with consumers when there's never anything different after than before. They're always the same. They just consume. Our problem was we were taking our consumers and we were shaping them into increasingly demanding consumers. All of this came crashing in on me during a program that we ran for five consecutive years each Lent. It was a Friday evening program. And it was multifaceted. There was mass. Stations of the Cross, uh, featured guest speaker, uh, there was child care, there were student programs, but the centerpiece of the evening was dinner, which we provided free of charge. You could make a free will offering if you wanted to, but there was no admission price to this dinner. And we did that on the theory that that would attract more people, which it did. Over the course of these five years that we ran this program, we grew it to about 500 people every single week. We called it Family Friendly Friday. But it wasn't really that friendly, at least not to us, to the people on staff, because we piled this program on top of everything else that we were already doing. That's what we do in our parishes, isn't it? We never stop doing anything. We just add more on top of what we're already doing. Well, the evening that I'm remembering was the sixth and final evening. And by the time we got to that point in the process, it seemed like we'd been doing it forever. And it was total burnout on staff for everyone. And think about it, this is Lent. We still have Holy Week and Easter Sunday, our busiest week of the year, up ahead. And we've already burned ourselves out. Well, anyway, I was serving the dinner, because that's what I thought I was supposed to do. I was supposed to serve the dinner. And this lady approached me to complain about the food. That would be the free food. She was complaining about the free food, and she was mean. She was really nasty about it. And quickly, she was joined by a chorus of, of like-minded individuals who all wanted to complain about the free food. I, something snapped that evening. Some artery exploded. I knew in an instant that I could no longer do this. This was my life, and I was wasting my time. Finally and at last, I asked that question, why am I doing this? But when we lose our why, we lose our purpose, we lose our way, we can find ourselves adrift. On a, on a dangerous sea, a sea that can be full of disappointment and depression and even despair. So we lose our why and we lose our way. So what is our why as a church? Well, to discover that, we return, as we always do, to our Savior and the why, the purpose, Jesus gave the, gave the church. And we see that most clearly displayed, most clearly and succinctly and simply laid out in Matthew's gospel in Matthew 28. Uh, Matthew 28 is the final chapter of his gospel. It begins with the empty tomb narratives. It ends with Jesus' ascension into heaven. And Jesus takes the 11 remaining loyal apostles, he brings them together, and he says this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now that sentence right there is, is packed with meaning. I mean, to truly understand it, we have to go all the way back to the beginning of the creation of the world, all the way back to Genesis, 
when God creates the earth and he gives it to our first parents and he gives them authority over the earth. But we know pretty quickly that our first parents, they surrendered that authority to the evil one. When they ate the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they abandoned that authority. They surrendered that authority to the evil one. And the story of the Old Testament is a story of God preparing to send his son into the world to win back that authority. And so Jesus comes to earth. He, he lives, and then he, he goes to the cross. He's bloody, he's bloody, he's beaten, he's bruised, he's nailed to the cross. He suffered, died, and is buried. And then he rises from the dead to win back the authority our first parents had surrendered. And so the apostles who have been witnesses of so much of this, he now says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, guys, listen. I am passing on that authority to you. I want you to take that authority, and I want you to go. I want you to go and... Now, think about what he does not say. He does not say, I want you to go and play bingo. I want you to go and run potluck suppers. I want you to go and run middle school lock-ins. As a former youth minister, thank you, Jesus, for not saying that. Jesus said this, I want you to go and make disciples. That's it. That's why the church exists. And in case the apostles weren't sure how many disciples they were supposed to make, you know, hey, Jesus, when have we fulfilled our quota and we can stop? Jesus says, make disciples of all nations. You don't stop, you don't rest until every single person has had an opportunity to come into a relationship with me. Now that's, that's the mission of the universal church, to make disciples of all nations. But if you're like me and Father Michael, you work in a parish. And so a parish is a geographical area that... And our job as people working in a parish, our mission, our wise people working in a parish is to make disciples, not just of the people who are in our pews or in our church, but everyone in our geographical area. As one pastor likes to put it, your zip code or your zip codes is your mission field. That for us in Timonium, Maryland, that's 21093, that is our mission field and our job, our responsibility, our why, our purpose is to make disciples of everyone in that area, not just the people in our church. Well, what does it mean to be a disciple? We could spend tons of time talking about that, but we like to say this. The disciple is a student who is learning to follow the master. And to be a disciple, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have your act completely together. You can still have a lot of bad habits and be a disciple. A disciple is someone who is, is working through the grace of God to be a little bit more like Jesus today than they were yesterday and working to be a little bit more like God, Jesus tomorrow than they are today. We say this, the disciple is someone who is growing, that's a key word, to love God, love others, and make disciples. A disciple is someone who's growing to love God. That seems pretty obvious that when Jesus was asked, by the teacher of the law, what is the greatest commandment? He said this, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And so for us, that begins, we believe, with going to Mass and worshiping God there. It continues through private disciplines like uh, prayer and fasting and giving. That to be growing in a relationship with God means it's growing this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That as Jesus said in John 10, his sheep hear his voice and they follow his voice and they will not follow the voice of another. That ultimately a disciple is learning to offer all their lives back to God as a living sacrifice, as Paul talks about in Romans 12, offering back their work life, their family life, their recreational life, their financial life back to God as an act of worship. But when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He didn't really give one, did he? He said, he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love God with all you have and, 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 and love your neighbor as yourself. That to love, 
love others goes hand in hand with loving God. To serve others, to be in fellowship with other believers, to accept others, to be kind to others, to encourage others. Then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. That there's some kind of self-care in being a follower of Jesus. That Jesus seems to indicate that our ability to love and care for others will fall or only rise to our ability to love and care for ourselves. So we say disciples are growing to love God, they're growing to love others, and they're growing to be disciples who make disciples. Throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus makes this promise. When he calls the first apostles, he says, follow me and I'll make you something. And he didn't say, follow me and I'll make you smarter, follow me and I'll make you richer. He didn't even say, follow me and I'll make you better or holier. He told them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That if you follow Jesus long enough, you will learn to bring other people into a relationship with him. And again, we see this throughout the Gospels. The, the woman at the well. Think about her. Here's a woman who goes to the well in the heat of the day to draw water because she does not want to uh, see anybody else from her town. And so she goes one day, and it's incredibly hot. She goes in the, the hottest part of the day because she so much wants to avoid everybody else in town. And there she has an encounter with Jesus. And, and Jesus meets her. He accepts her as he is, despite knowing all her faults and failures and foibles. He accepts her. And then she runs back to town and says, come and see a man who knows everything about me. And everybody knew everything about her. But everyone knew her story. But... She says, come and see a man who's known everything, who knows everything about me and still loves me and accepts me. Could this maybe be the Messiah? And she has this encounter with Jesus, with the same woman who did not want to even talk to people in her town, who did everything to avoid them, now runs to them to tell them about Jesus. Or the Gerasene demoniac. Mark tells us the story, you know, we just had it this past week in the gospel, where at a certain point Jesus gets in a boat, and crosses over the Sea of Galilee. Remember the apostles? They think they're going to die. And there's this huge storm. And you know Jesus quiets it. And they get to the other region, uh, other side of the lake. And there's a man possessed by a legion of demons. And Jesus drives out the demons. And then he gets right back in the boat. He seemingly, he seemingly came all this way for one guy. And as Jesus gets back in the boat, the man who'd been possessed by the demons tries to get back in as well. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, no, no. You go back and you tell people what God has done for you. Apparently he did, because the next time Jesus comes to that same region of the world, there are crowds and crowds of people coming to hear Jesus teach and to be healed by him. So disciples are growing to love God, love others, and make disciples. And so we recognize in our own story, in our own leadership of the church, we were not leading people to be disciples of Jesus Christ. We were not creating disciples or making disciples. We were making super religious consumers. Our programs were not leading people to give more of their lives to God. They were not making them to more loving people or to lead other people in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So in other words, we were not succeeding as Jesus called us to succeed. Our journey took off when we humbled ourselves at least a little bit to to learn from others. And eventually we did the obvious thing which had not at all been obvious to us. We looked to other churches who were successful churches, healthy churches, intentionally growing churches. We set out to learn from healthy, intentionally growing churches what we could learn, even if that meant turning to evangelicals. We started at, at a place called Saddleback Church in Orange County, California. Has anybody heard of Saddleback Church in Orange County, California? Pastor Rick Warren's church, who, of course, uh, more recently was the author of the number one best-selling book, The Purpose Driven Life. Just uh, in, within the past few months, he, he met with Pope Francis at Pope Francis's invitation. But at that time, we had never heard of him. And we didn't know who he was. And through a series of circumstances, it would take too long to explain, we found ourselves there. And I remember the first time that we were at Saddleback, we, we, we felt scared to be there. We were afraid that we might be uh, outed as Catholics in an evangelical setting, that somehow we might be un 
welcome among them. Being on their campus felt different, for sure, as, as in being on a different planet. It was kind of overwhelming. I remember parking the car and approaching a building that I assumed was the church building, only to discover that it was the nursery building. This three-story, brand-new, state-of-the-art facility uh, totally dedicated to Sunday school for nursery school students. On the other hand, when we made our way to the church, it was big for sure, but it was entirely plain. It was just like uh, a Walmart with chairs. Um, in, my, in my experience, successful churches, growing churches, were big, beautiful churches with lots of architectural details and fancy finishes. There was nothing fancy here at all. It didn't make any sense to me. It was a paradigm shift that I couldn't quite comprehend. But it wasn't even primarily the buildings or the campus. It was the people. The people that we encountered at Saddleback Church were so different than the people at our parish. They were so friendly. They were so happy. They were so friendly and happy to see us. I'll never forget, we entered in through the front doors of the church, and we were so warmly, lovingly greeted by the host ministers, the greeters at the door. It was such a lovely experience that I exited out a side door and circled back around to see if it would happen a second time. What did they have to be so happy about? You know, I've been in church my whole life. I've dedicated my life to church. I spent six years in the city of Rome. I've never seen people this happy at church before. So after going to Saddleback, we learned a lot from going there. And we continue to, to go back to Saddleback a few times. We also learned from some other evangelical churches, uh, Willow Creek in Chicago, um, North Point in Atlanta. And as we went to these churches, uh, we, we learned many different lessons. And part of it just came from getting out of our comfort zone, as Father Michael mentioned. And, and I think it's a key, uh, key life point or key life lesson is that growth always comes outside of our comfort zone. That because we were forced to get outside of our comfort zone into these other settings that were different for us, it forced us to grow. And that was a, a key point. But there were three key strategies we learned from these churches. And that's what we want to spend the rest of our time sharing with you today. That, as we said, dr have driven the transformation of our church. Number one, we learned that we needed to change our focus from church people to unchurched people. That we needed to think about church from the perspective of the person not coming to church. And that's very hard for us in church world because we're, we're church people. But we realized if we wanted to, these churches were growing because they had a crystal clear focus and understanding of the people in their community who were not coming to church. Uh, number two, we realized we needed to prioritize the weekend experience. And by that, we mean mass and the programs we put around mass. That these churches had excellent weekend experiences, and ours was far from excellent. Uh, if you've read our book, Rebuilt, we call this chapter, it's about the weekend stupid, and we're the stupid. And uh, it's a, a paraphrase of James Carville's about the 1992 election, if you remember. Uh, he had a very sticky statement. No matter who you voted for, you probably remember it. It's about the economy stupid. And that was a very sticky statement, memorable statement, that helped get uh, Clinton elected president and helped kept everybody focused in that campaign from Clinton to the volunteer, that they were going to hammer the economy. Well, we want to say we want to make sure we, we uh, get the weekend right. So it's about the weekend stupid. Prioritize the weekend experience. And then third, we need to move church people to action. That we need to challenge them to take ownership of their faith. That we had been seeing, as Father Michael talked about, the people as consumers and our job to provide products. But instead, that we need to think about the people in the church as people in, in this movement of the church. And challenge them to take ownership of their, uh, of their faith, number one. Take ownership of their faith, make it personal. Number two, to take responsibility for the mission of the church to make disciples. So we'll start with number one. We need to change our focus from church people to unchurch people. Change in our church came when we took the focus off ourselves and the people that were already in the pews and began to think about creating an environment in which the people who weren't there might actually 
want to be a part of. If you think about your, your parish community, and it's anything like ours in Timonium, there are far more people who are not going to church, and by that I mean any church of any kind, than there are people who are going to church. Those unchurched people are your potential growth <coughs> market, if you'll permit us to put it into those terms. So we began to focus on the unchurched person in our community by, first of all, describing him. What does he look like? Being in Timonium, we came to call this mythical figure Tim. Timonium Tim. It's kind of cute, kind of annoying, but it's also quite memorable. And there's hardly a Sunday that goes by that somebody, some newcomer, won't come up to us and say, Hi, I'm Tim. Let me tell you about Tim. Tim is a good guy. He grew up Catholic. He was confirmed Catholic. But once he was confirmed, his mom stopped making him go to Mass, and he stopped going. He's never looked back. Tim is kind of confused about his Catholic faith. What he knows is a muddled mess of what he thinks he remembers from confirmation class and what he's learned from the Da Vinci Code. Tim has a stressful life. He's got a ridiculously long commute into downtown Baltimore every day. He's got a demanding job with crazy hours and lots of travel. He's got three kids in three different schools that pull him in three different directions. He's living financially way beyond his means, which is a source of, of frustration and tension and conflict in his marriage. His marriage is not going as well as it should be. Tim has other darker secrets, too. On Sunday mornings, Tim wants to relax. Tim wants some Tim time. Uh, if the Ravens are in town, he's at Raven Stadium. If the weather's nice, he's playing golf at Baltimore Country Club. Maybe he's out attending his kids' various sports programs. Maybe he's just kicking back at home. But guess what Tim is not doing and what he never, ever even considers doing on a Sunday morning? Going to church. It's not even on the potential to-do list. And at the same time, when we evaluated our church experience on the weekends, we realized that if by some miracle, of grace or nature, Tim actually did show up. There was really nothing there for him. There was nothing of any interest for him. There was nothing that would have any traction for him. It was just a boring, bad experience in his estimation. As a church community in this country, I think we have, we, this, the, the church in this country was built on the basic philosophy, build it and they will come. We just keep building it, opening the doors, and in they pour. That day is done. And when we recognize that together, we can move on. So uh, Father Michael described our Timonium Tim. Uh, this would be a great exercise to go back to your parish and describe your South Bend Scott. I don't know. So anyway, <laughs> but to go back to your, or wherever you might be from, to go back and share and to talk about with your team, either your, par your parish council, your staff, whoever you think appropriate your church, who is that person not coming to church? To describe them, what's, what's competing for his or her time? Um, why, why don't they come? Uh, what are their hopes, their fears, their dreams? What's their economic bracket? All those kind of questions. Uh, and here's why this is important. Because when we, as a parish staff, are planning an event or talking about a, a message we're going to give or, or, or something like that, we say this, what would Tim think of that? And what that does in our, the, our culture as a parish and as our staff is to help us get all in the same wavelength. Oh, yeah, we need to be constantly thinking about the unchurched person in our community because we want to be appealing to him and to her. So it really will help you to enculturate and to put into your um, the, the, the culture of your parish and, and your thinking, the unchurched person. Because, and so I would really encourage you, again, take an hour, hour and a half to do that as a staff. Who is your unchurched person? 
Because the reality of, of, of church world is this. We tend to get insular. We tend to forget about the people not coming to church. It, I don't know what that is uh, about the church, and maybe it's true of any organization or organism, but that we tend to get insular and forget about the people not coming and what defining your unchurched person your community will help you fight against that tide. So number one, we realize we need to focus on church, the unchurched person in our community. That's the best opportunity for us to grow as a church. We're going to grow as a church. We're going to reach people who aren't coming to church. And then second, that our best opportunity then to reach Tim is on the weekend. And so uh, we want to invest in our weekend experience and make it the best uh, we possibly can so we can put people on the path of discipleship and reach Tim, reach the unchurched. Now, if you think about it, it is wiser to invest our time on the weekend, again, meaning the mass and programs around it, than any other event. Uh, Father Michael talked about that family-friendly Fridays that we used to do. And we, that took years to build up. We busted it to, to grow about five, maybe 600 people. And it took years, and we worked really hard on it. And at the same time, during those years, Mass was, when we had our weekend attendance, was probably around 1,800 people or so. So nearly triple the amount of people were, were coming to Mass, uh, more than triple, were coming to Mass on the weekend, but we weren't investing our time and energy there. So the, the weekend has the greatest opportunity to make an impact on people. And if you think about it too, when people have a bad weekend experience, if they come to Mass on the weekend and, and we don't do a very good job, then they assume we have nothing else to say to them. So for Tim, if Tim comes, the unchurched person comes, and it's a bad experience, he says, well, they can't get their act together here. Why should I trust them to speak into my life? If this experience is boring and bad, as it was in our case at our church, then why should I trust what the church is saying and let them speak into my life? And for the people who are coming to our church and maybe are coming uh, regularly or are going to come no matter what, if those experiences are bad, they're not going to get on the discipleship path. You know, if the one hour or 45 minutes is bad enough, I'm not giving more of my time to the church if that's a bad experience. I use the analogy of a restaurant. You know, you go to a restaurant for good food, good service, and a good environment. But if you go to a, a restaurant and, and the food is terrible, the, the, the wait staff is, is mean and nasty to you, and the cutlery is dirty, you really don't care how well they do their accounting. You're not going back to that restaurant. And so when our mass and our weekend, atten our weekend programs were boring and bad, we were, we were telling Tim, the church has nothing to teach you, nothing to say to you. And what was worse is that when church was boring and bad and irrelevant, God is, uh, Tim assumed that God was irrelevant to his life. And so we also would say this. You know, we have to acknowledge that when it comes especially to reaching Tim or the unchurched person, the Eucharist is not enough. If the Eucharist was enough, then every Catholic church in our country would be filled. But I think what is happening is that Jesus wants us to bring our efforts and our energy. In Colossians 1.24, Paul says that he is making up for what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. What's lacking in the sufferings of Christ? Nothing, except what he chooses to leave for us to bring into, uh, the, the what he chooses to leave for us to do. I think it's true in saving and, and sharing the value of the Eucharist. So we say that there's three major pillars creating an excellent weekend experience. Music, message, and ministers. Again, to repeat, the Mass is the source and summit of our faith it deserves our very best efforts. It's important that church people have a great experience of the Eucharist so that they can be drawn into it so that they can begin to grow in their appreciation of it. And if the principal elements of the Eucharist are lacking, if they're boring and bad, and it's telling him that there's really nothing here of value for you. Music, message, and ministers are the three prongs of our approach to a great weekend experience. Let's begin at the beginning. Let's begin with the music. 
focusing on the weekend from the perspective of the young church person, from Tim's perspective, means it's all about the music. The weekend experience should be a form of transportation, taking the participant on an emotional and intellectual and ultimately a spiritual journey to the higher things of God. The United States Catholic Conference of Bishops in its document, Sing to the Lord, said this, God has bestowed on his people the gift of song. God dwells within each human person in that place where music takes its source. Indeed, God, the giver of song, is present whenever his people sing his praises. A cry deep within our being, music is a way for God to lead us to the realm of higher things. We like to say that music is the water on which our weekend experience sails. Music does what words alone cannot do. It's capable, uh, capable of expressing a dimension of meaning and feeling that words alone cannot convey. More than any other experience in, in, the, in the weekend, experience. It is the music that can touch and change people's hearts for better or for worse. Historically, at our parish, in the Nativity Parish, music was a problem. It was a huge problem. As is typical of many parishes in our part of the country, our weekend program included some musical options. There were three masses that were designated as organ and cantor masses. There was, one, there was one mass that was called the folk mass, and one mass that was called the quiet mass. The folk mass was far and away the more popular of the musical choices, perhaps because it was the easiest to listen to, perhaps because it was the easiest to tune out. The musicians, the group, tried their best, but they struggled mightily. The presentation was flawed. The music that they played was dated and, and uninteresting. At the other masses, the music was worse. It was far worse. Some of the choir members were more convinced of their talent than they had reason to be. Their accumulated sound was difficult. It was harsh. It was it was grievous. Some of our cantors were simply prima donnas in clear performance mode. I'll never forget my first Christmas Eve at the parish. We were getting ready for the 4 o'clock Mass on Christmas Eve. You all know what that looks like, right? Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and in the midst of this chaos, I am attempting to get the Mass started on time. And it's essential that we start on time because we've got three more masses lined up behind this one and lots of traffic coming our way too. But we couldn't start because the cantor wasn't there. She was late. She was always late. But eventually she comes running in, music, water bottles flying everywhere. She gets up to the podium on the altar in front of everybody and she is wildly kind of arranging herself and getting organized. And I'm standing in the back of the church, kind of waving, trying to get her started. Finally, I catch her attention. She looks at me, furious, and she says into the microphone for the whole congregation to hear, I start when I'm ready. She's no longer with us. <laughs> When it came to the other music, it, it, was, it was just as, as bad or worse. Not surprisingly, on some weekends, the most popular weekend mass was the one with no music at all. People just didn't want to be bothered with it. You know, early on, we had a town hall meeting to listen to the range of concerns that we'd inherited in coming to this parish. And as we've suggested, mostly people in the parish were apathetic about what was going on, except when it came to the music. And that evening turned into a virtual riot of bitter complaint all about 
the music. And we had to agree with much of what was said. They were right. We had terrible music. We did. It was just awful. And we wouldn't have come to our church if we weren't paid to be there on the weekends. We had terrible music, and that made people angry, too. Think about that. People were coming to our church on the weekends for the Eucharist, and we sent them away angry. Wow, what an accomplishment. You want to know what we did about our problem? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because we didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Who've been there 25 years? <laughs> anybody, the if, you, if, you don't, if you don't count the parishioners as anybody. The deal is that music has the greatest potential to reach people, and for that reason, I suppose, uh, in the spiritual realm, it's going to be the, diff the difficult piece to get right. But it's worth the investment, it's worth the hard work, it's worth the difficult conversations that you need to have, it's worth asking the people who need to step down to step down in order to grow your program to the very best program that it can be. So creating a great weekend experience, prioritizing the weekends about music and then message. Uh, that's what we call our homily, is the message. Uh, Proverbs 18, and this is appropriate for this conference, uh, Proverbs 18.21 says this, uh, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So words are powerful. And the word of God is even more powerful. As Hebrews 4.12 says, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, God created the world by speaking it into existence. And if you reflect on your own spiritual journey, uh, you can probably think of a time when a homily or a teaching or something from a professor just spoke words that totally changed your life. Uh, maybe for you, you used to think of God as this kind of cosmic cop in the sky or this, this religious rule keeper until somebody explained, no, God is your heavenly father who sent his son to die for you. Or maybe you had a thinking on a moral teaching uh, or a social justice issue, and you thought it was this way, and you were, you, you were totally thought you were right, and somebody broke down the church's teaching or, teaching or explained something to you, and you had a total conversion when it came to that issue. And those words changed your life. Uh, for me, I look at uh, my a, approach to money, that uh, growing up didn't really, uh, I was, I, Went to church, did not really hear a lot about money. Uh, kind of grew up not knowing how to handle it, not thinking it was very important. Uh, and as a result of that, it led to a lot of debt, uh, credit card debt, student loan debt, car debt. I had a whole bunch of debt. Uh, and also, I was not very generous to God. I didn't really give to the church. I didn't think that was really my responsibility at all. And, until I began hearing these messages, these sermons about about money and what God said about money. And I would hear things like, you can't be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ and be lost in your finances. I uh, heard things from, from Mal preaching on Malachi chapter 3 where God says to, to the Israelites, bring the full tithe into my storehouse and see if then I will not pour blessing upon you. And I heard these, these teachings and began to change my life. And I began obeying some of the things I heard from the scriptures, and I, I began following what God said about money, and it totally changed my life, both when it came to becoming a more generous giver and helped me get out of debt. And so those words changed my life. All of us can point to some part of our spiritual story where simply words and hearing God's word specifically has changed our life. And, and so the word of God is powerful. Uh, the message or the homily is the opportunity where people can see the relevance of God's word that is forming people's attitudes towards scripture. So what people hear on the homily on Sunday, it forms their attitudes towards scripture. It's an opportunity for them to go deeper into the scripture and lead them to a place of respect and reverence for God's word. That the homily is an opportunity to give hundreds of people, maybe thousands depending upon um, how many people are attending, spiritual direction. Acts 20, Paul talks about he's leaving the elders of Ephesus, and he says I, I, he leaves with a clear conscience because he has not shrunk from giving the full counsel of God. 
It's a homily, it's the opportunity, and, or any kind of teaching for us, is an opportunity to give God's counsel to the people under our care. For the unconnected, it's how they are fed. Don't know how many times Father Michael and I, in visiting some of these other churches, would meet former Catholics who had left their church, and they said, you know what, I just didn't feel fed there. And what we know they were fed on the Eucharist, but they weren't being fed was God's word. The message of the homily, it can breathe life into dead areas of your, par uh, of your parish. For us, um, crucial in changing both our, the finances of our parish, because Father Michael preaching on what God's word says about money is, has transformed the uh, finances of our parish, and on volunteerism. That it can, the word of God it, it can speak life into dead areas of your parish. Uh, think about Ezekiel 37. You know, God leads Ezekiel out to that valley of dry, dead bones. And God says to Ezekiel, can these bones come back to life? And Ezekiel says, I don't know, God. You're God. You tell me. And God says, well, speak to these bones. Prophesy to these bones. Speak the word of God to them. And Ezekiel does that, and the bones begin to rattle. And suddenly they begin coming closer together, and the sinews come upon them, the flesh come upon them. That's an image for us of what can happen when we speak God's word consistently and break it open for people. Life, death can lead to life. So music, uh, the, me the weekend is about music, message, and then finally we say ministers. And by that we mean the key volunteer ministers in our church. Uh, there's two major teams that are, are vitally important to our church when it comes to creating uh, an, what we would call an irresistible environment. Uh, number one is what we call our, our host team ministries, which is uh, composed of our, our parking ministers, our greeters who are at the door, um, then our host team members. Um, they kind of perform the traditional usher role, but we changed the title. We rebranded them because usher in our parish has come to mean mean, grumpy man that stares at you as you come to church. So we call them the host team members. And so what these teams are doing, again, is creating layers of welcoming, that we're in a suburban community. So when people drive to our campus, their first experience is in the parking lot. And so we have parking ministers there who are, are helping show you to a spot. They're smiling at you. They're wa you know, waving at you. Father Michael likes to say that the message begins in the parking lot. And then as you, you come up the steps, there's readers at the door again smiling at you, opening the door, saying hello, welcome, we're glad you're here. Um, then again, as I said, the host team members are helping you find a seat, they help with collection. But again, all these are layers of welcoming to create an irresistible environment. And these teams working together are communicating, hey, you know, we're excited you're here. You know, that we're, we're organized, we're prepared for visitors, we're prepared for people who haven't come to church before. So we're excited you're here, we're, we're welcoming you, we're organizing you, we're organized. This, is, this isn't just going to church, we're here to meet the living God. And this is especially important for Tim, for the unchurched person. Because even though we can say things like all are welcome and that kind of thing, the re reality is that people who have not been to church in a long time assume they are not welcome. And so all of this is a level of communication that is helping to disarm people who haven't been to church in a long time, to help lower their defenses so the word of God can pierce their heart. So uh, there's our, our host ministries, and then the second major team, at least at our church, it's very important when it comes to ministers, is children's ministers. Because we're, we're in a community that has lots of families. And I really think when it comes to children's ministry, that it really is the low-hanging fruit in many places. Let me explain why I think that. Number one, I think when you have, I, I have seven kids, um, so maybe it's just bias, and I want children's ministry for all my kids. But no, you know, when you become, if you're, uh, for those of you who are parents or uh, you know, siblings who became parents, when when you become a parent, you become so aware of your own failures, and weaknesses, and inefficiencies, um, and so. You, you kind of know automatically you need help from someone else. And, and so it opens us up to coming to church. You know, I, I remember before I had kids, if I was out and about and you know, going to the grocery store or, or, or out somewhere, 
and I see a parent yelling at a little kid, and I would just shake my head and I would think, what a bad parent. You know, now if I'm out and about and I see a parent yelling at a little kid, I shake my head and I think, I've been there. I was a much better father before I had kids. <laughs> and so as parents, we know we need some help, and the church can be there to partner with them. Also, I think parents, especially of young kids, there's still, I don't know how much longer it's going to be there, but there's still a desire to give kids religion. Maybe not faith, but religion uh, in, in our culture. So uh, a few years ago, I read a book by A.J. Jacobs uh, called uh, Year of Living Biblically, and he, he's a secular Jew living in New York, but uh, and it's kind of a funny book, but he, he was, he's a secular Jew, and he's going to try to live out all the commands of the Bible, and that's the, what he's going to do. In the beginning of the book, he acknowledged he's an agnostic. He doesn't believe in God, or he's not sure about God. And by the end of the book, he's still an agnostic, but he has this son who's about three years old, and he decides he's going to take him to synagogue because he wants to give him religion. And I think that's still in our culture, and there's still an opportunity to capitalize on that. Children's ministry can be huge. Again, I'm especially thinking younger children, fifth grade and under, can be huge because children are much more evangelical. They will tell their kids about church. Uh, they'll tell their friends about church. They'll talk about church at school or on the playground, and they're not afraid to do that, whereas adults, we get a little more scared. We don't want to offend anybody. What if they don't like what we say? Kids don't care. They'll just, they'll just share. And so for all these reasons, you know, children's ministry um, is it's just a, a huge low-hanging fruit uh, when it comes to, to the church and to attracting unchurched people. Um, and so for us, here's what that means. Here's how that plays out very uh, practically. Then I want to I read a letter for you. Um, that's what my phone's for. I'm not checking the message. I'm not texting or anything. Um, it's, it's here on my phone. I want to read a letter for you uh, after that. But um, so for us, here's, here's, as, here's how it plays out. I have, as I said, seven kids. And my oldest is 13, he's Max, and he, um, he just comes, when we go to Mass on Sunday, my wife and I, we usually go Saturday night, he just comes to Mass with us. So my 11-year-old uh, Gus, and my 9-year-old Nate, and my 7-year-old Elsa, uh, when they come to Mass with us, they go to uh, Time Travelers, which is our Children's Liturgy of the Word program. So they come to us at the beginning of Mass, then Time Travelers is at the Liturgy of the Word, and then they go to, they come back for the Liturgy of the Eucharist. Uh, then I have, uh, how many more kids? I've lost the track. Um, three more, three more. Kefa, who is five, he goes to All, Star, uh, All Stars, which is a program for four, five, and six-year-olds. And he goes to that program, he goes for the whole Mass, and then um, my, uh, my one-year-old, Lydia, and my, my nearly three-year-old, Caleb, they go to Kid Zone, which is their children's program for one to three-year-olds. And so, in all these programs, they're not just babysitting, but they're actually preparatory for helping them understand the Mass and grow in understanding the Mass and to grow in a relationship with God. And at the same time, my wife, me and I, we can go to Mass, we can worship God, we can listen to Father Michael's homily, and we can grow in our faith. Let me just read this letter to you, as I said, that kind of encapsulate everything I'm saying about the ministers. Write this. Uh, this is from Josh. He wrote, Dear Nativity, I want to thank everyone at the church for being so welcoming and friendly to our family. For us, the barrier that Nativity has removed is the frustration we've experienced with having our three children attend Mass with us. We had taken many months off from attending any church because we've become so frustrated, continually trying to keep our children quiet or occupied while getting nothing out of it at all except irritated with one another. Someone recommended Nativity, so we gave it a try. On our first visit, a very friendly person led us around and showed us where we could take our children. She was welcoming and helpful, and our kids were so comfortable with the experience, they wanted to come back. Every time we've entered or left church, someone has smiled at us and greeted us, and that means so much. The parking volunteers were helpful, dedicated, and friendly. The hospitality and service, the fellowship, and the incredible organization have convinced us that Christ's presence is alive in this church. Again, so they're talking about all the volunteers who are really convincing them that Christ's presence is alive in the church. The program for our 20-month-old is wonderful and safe, and all stars for our four- and five-year-old children has helped enrich their church experiences. Thanks to Nativity, my wife and I can now sit as a couple for an hour, worship, 
sing, and renew our spirits just enough to make it through another crazy week. We look forward to every Sunday now. We plan to start getting more involved to come to believe is the only way to keep our faith alive. So that, that letter really <laughs> describes all that we're trying to accomplish. And uh, that was written by, by Josh, and he was true to his word. He actually serves now on our 9 o'clock host team ministry. And his wife, Megan, actually works part-time on our staff on our time travelers program. So the music, so we want to think about church from the unchurched person's perspective. Create a great weekend experience and with three pillars of music, message, and ministers. And then just finally, again, the last one is want to um, challenge the church people uh, to take responsibility for their faith and not think of them as consumers. And, and all I would say with you, to, to kind of, we want to stop here for questions, is what do you want the people in your church to do? What are the key steps of discipleship that you think they need to take? For us, we have five steps we want them to take. We want them um, to serve in ministry and missions. And don't have time to really go too deep in these, but I'll just say these are our five that we've discerned over time. We want people to serve in ministry and missions. We think service is absolutely vital to grow as a follower of Christ. We want them to tithe and give. We think money is absolutely necessary. Uh, to become a giver financially is absolutely necessary to grow as a follower of Christ. Uh, we want them to engage in small groups because we think relationships are huge for growing in faith. Uh, practice prayer and sacraments. So we want to teach people in our church how to pray and to engage the sacraments in a way not of just ritual but of, of growing in faith. And then finally, uh, share their faith to evangelize. So um, go deeper into all those. Those are our five. But again, my, my encouragement to you is to go back to your church and say, what do we want people to do to grow as disciples? So we'll stop there and ask questions.